Next from Chicago, our contributing correspondent Jeff Berkowitz talks with Republican House member Thomas Morrison about the state's troubled pension systems. We'll also hear Representative Morrison's ideas on the leading Republican candidates for governor. This runs about 30 minutes. Public Affairs, Berkowitz is my name and politics is our game. As I said, we're going to have a great show this evening. A great show this evening. And we can do something a little unusual. Let's see if we can get the camera right on him. Our guest tonight is? Tom Morrison. State Rep. Tom Morrison. He's right. been there for three years, okay? Actually, he's just starting his third year. But the thing of it is, and a lot of people don't realize this, State Rep. Tom Morrison is leading a revolution in state employee pension reform. Right? Uh, yeah, it's, it would be a bold, bold uh, move forward. You and Representative Jeannie Ives, who's been yeah. here, and Senator Jim Oberwise. Correct, yeah. And, and, and uh, the Illinois Policy Institute. Uh huh. You guys are all in cahoots. You'd all like and, to. And teachers, too, who are, start to hear about my plan. and The when teachers they, like it? Some do when they find out what it actually does. Yeah. All right. So we can talk about that. So, you know, as I said, we're going to talk about that. It's not just some esoteric topic, okay? State employee pension reform is really key because it relates to really the economy. If you're a major firm and you're thinking of moving here and you hear there's a hundred billion dollar underfunding. Plus, hundred billion plus. Yeah. Plus, somebody's going to figure, well, one, that's not too good. It has instability in the economy. Somebody's going to have to raise taxes to the Money has to it. come from somewhere. It's going to come right. from maybe people moving out, moving in because you're, the others have already left. Yeah. So, in a nutshell, State Representative Tom Morrison. What should be done about the underfunding and the inadequacy and the improprieties of the state employee pension or fund pension plan? Well, one thing we know is that the state has proven that it cannot run defined benefit pension plans very well. Uh, few entities can, whether it's, we're talking about one of the 50 states, whether we're talking about um, uh, big private business, companies. private companies, many, many entities that used to have defined benefit plans or, you know, where the retiree was given a, a guaranteed amount every year until, until death, and in many cases even to spouses, um, you know, for many years beyond that, uh, they've proven that they can't operate it very well. There's too many variables, too many unknowns. Uh, it's very easy to make promises today that don't have to be fulfilled for 20 or 30 or 40 years from now. Okay. So that's what they've done. The politicians have screwed it up. It, Republicans and Democrats for the last, I don't know, 30 or 40 years. Um, they don't fund it properly. Also, I would say, and I think this is supported by studies by the Illinois Policy Institute, the benefits are too high. There are people who say, um, like Ralph Mortieri, Center for Tax and Budget Accountability, he said, oh no, the benefits aren't too high. This is all a matter of the government just screwing up. Would you say that government employees on average in the state of Illinois get pension benefits that are in excess of what the private sector pays? Would you say their total salaries? Let me withdraw that simpler question. Would you say the total compensation for state employees on average exceeds that of their counterparts in the private sector when you count their salary, their pensions, their benefits, and so forth? Yeah, I, th I think that the data backs that up. Okay. That there's generally um, you know, anywhere from a 10 to 20 percent, in some cases more. It depends upon the position, it depends upon the education level, the actual job. So the benefits um, are out of, out of whack, but then the politicians have, put it, put, have, have not funded it regularly as they should have. They've had ridiculous things like cost of living adjustments well, that glad, aren't cost of living adjustments. Tell people about that. Yeah, I, I'm glad you brought that up because the, the, the biggest thing is not actually the salaries. Uh, the salary is a component, but the biggest problem is that if it's a, if you consider it a problem, but individuals are living a lot longer. And so you brought up the cost of living adjustment. Right now, retirees are promised 3% compounded adjustment annually. So even though and it says so, cost of living, it's not because the cost of living sometimes in recent years, we've had zero remains inflation. Remains stagnant or, we've right. We've had 1%, yeah. one and a half. So if it's cost of living, it would mean their COLA should have been zero that year or it should have been 1% when it was 1%. But no, it was zero cost, zero inflation, and they got a 3% increase. Right, it and compounds. Then, and it compounds, <laughs> meaning next year, the 3%, if it was 3%, again, wasn't just on their base salary, right. but it was on their base salary, which started plus the, third, the 3% increase. So this is how this works out. If an individual is retiring when they're in their 50s or in their early 60s, and that individual lives for 20, 25, 30, 35, 40 years, 
into retirement, then their employee contributions, their employer contributions, don't anywhere near add up to what has been promised to be paid out well into retirement, so and then to the spouses too, and then to the spouses too. Where does all this money come from? Because people say, oh, it doesn't, don't worry, it's the government, okay? It's <laughs> the just the state government, uh, it's the state government, so we don't have to worry about it, Tom, you and I don't, yeah, your the, neighbors the, the, don't. The government is, is, uh, is you and I. Oh, so and this is the way, so <laughs> when, when taxes, when your income is taxed at 3%, so for instance, in the olden days, when you were earning, maybe a couple had 50000 each, so you had roughly $100,000 in income. Well, remember back a few years ago, your income tax rate was 3%. So roughly 3% of 100000 you'd be paying 3000 mm -hmm. But then the Democrats, and this was completely passed by the Democrats. I'm not yeah, being partisan. It passed uh, about, about 10 hours before I got sworn in. Before you got it, they raised the income tax rate from 3% to 5%. For so people yeah. who earned uh, that ghastly sum of $100,000, oh, you were filthy rich. If you earned $100,000, you're filthy rich. And so Pat Quinn would say, Pat, come on, defend us. He would say, oh, you should pay more. OK, you should pay more. And, and what if you earned each $100,000 or 125, and then you had 250? He said, oh, you're way too rich. Your money, that's not your money. It's our money, right, the government's. So the point is, if you had been paying $3,000 in taxes at a $100,000 salary, you're now paying five percent, 5,000 in taxes. Right. If you had $200,000 and you were paying $6,000, 3% of mm -hmm. 200 would be 6,000, right? Mm -hmm. and then you went up to 10,000, okay? And that doesn't count your property taxes, which goes to mainly schools, schools right, yeah. uh, or other county issues. Doesn't count your sales taxes. Doesn't count your taxes on dividends or capital gains or whatnot. Doesn't right. count, of course, their federal taxes. Right. Oh no. This is all for the joy, for the joy of supporting a bunch of legislators who've grown accustomed. Tom, you have to realize this. I mean, it's not to you. But really, wouldn't you say the legislators have grown accustomed to a nice lifestyle? Uh, it, it's not an easy job. It's not for everybody. But it well, needs to be more. Well, if your name is more... Speaker Mike Madigan. Well. If it... your name is Speaker Mike Madigan. Let me just interrupt you. Yeah. Second. Now, he only makes, like, probably a speaker, 80 or 90,000. Because he makes a little bit more because he's speaker, because he's probably chairman yeah. of the committees and so forth. But what does he make if he's, like, at a major firm that does real estate tax assessments? And people know if they come to him, somehow their assessments won't go up as much. It's kind of magical, right? And so what do you think the speaker makes in roughly each year from I, his law firm? I would Just have give no me a wild idea. guess. I'm not going to guess. I have no it idea. It probably is a million, two million, three million, something like that. I don't know. I mean, what would people, it's a relatively small law firm, let me, and let people me, pay a lot to get their tax yeah. assessments down. So I'm just saying, getting, it, we, so I know we got away from the pension, pension fund. but, but, but <clears throat> no, but it's, it's really related because you want to say these pensions, okay, that people get, they never really were negotiated in good faith because the people who were negotiating them were like this, you know, the politicians essentially or the state employees under the politicians who had the unions there and they wanted to please the public sector unions. Mm -hmm. So it's not like oh, FMC or Ford or Microsoft negotiating with its employees. Right. These guys, they didn't really care because if you're the CEO of Microsoft and you screwed up in the negotiation, you may not be CEO next year. Right. If you're Chris Redonio, for instance, we don't want to pick on Chris, but she's never here, so yeah, I guess we will. So if you're the Senate Republican leader named Chris Redonio, you're never evaluated on performance. Never. Okay? Because Chris came in, what wasn't it, like 32, 27, something? The Republicans were down, but just slightly. Mm -hmm. And now it's 40, 19. Mm. It's a te that's a terrible performance, isn't it? It, it uh, doesn't bode well for the taxpayers because there is un okay. uneven, <laughs> it's an uneven playing field. You have everything you said about the, the union bosses is, is accurate. Uh, but back to pensions, back to okay. what I bring to the table as a legislator, this is what I told my district. Uh, I'm, I will vote for a meaningful pension solution. And what part of it be? was, well, okay. part of my bill was House Bill 3303. Uh, what it would do is it would preserve what workers have earned up to today, whatever credits they've earned in the pensions plans, to today, they would be guaranteed that. Starting tomorrow, and for the rest of their career, however long that happens to last, two years, or 30 years, or 40 years, they are going to pay into a 401k. 
And so upon retirement age, reaching retirement age, it would be like getting a hybrid payout. They would get what they've been promised up to the effective date, but then moving forward, it would be a lot like the private okay. sector. And this is what I, <laughs> when I was running my business, I ran a, a cleaning business. Um, anytime we had to do something very difficult or we had to ask the employees to do something very hard, we did it first. We took the first hit, we set the example, and so I did not take a legislator pension. Right I now, opted you, out. you don't. You don't. You opted am, out. You have not. And spent as two permanent, years you've been here, you've received. You've not. I'm well, not. You're not. You're not accruing pension benefits. You're telling me that's for the first correct. two years you've been there. Right now, you're telling are, you're declining the pension. Yeah, and that's that's offer. a permanent opt out. You okay. you once you're out, you cannot get how, back in. How many legislators do you know? There are how many? At least we've got 59 senators. We have 118. 18, so reps. that's 177 total yeah. state legislators. Of the 177 state legislators, how many would you say are doing what you are They're opting out? Over 20. 20? Well, yeah, that's, over 20. That's really, that's right. good. People didn't realize that. Yeah. I didn't yeah. realize that. Right. Do they tend to be more Republican or Democratic? Or is it um, the first year it was all Republican. I think there are a, a, a handful of Democrats. Would in, it be Senate uh, President John Culberson? It one? would not be. No, it would not he, be Senate President He's got President so much time. money, John. Well, why wouldn't you do it? Come here and defend yourself. John used to come on the show, but yeah. now he says not so much. But would it be Speaker Mike Madigan? Would he be one? Uh, it wouldn't be him either, no. He's got so much money. Yeah. Why do uh, these guys do it? Just Do they think they really need that additional funding? I, I don't know. I don't want to get into that. I'm just okay. saying that legislators ought to be on a more equal playing field with the taxpayers who have elected them. I mean, that's, that's okay. really what it comes down to. So that extends like to the federal level because as we're taping the show on September 30th, people are saying we're facing a shutdown of government. Mm -hmm. And it's because those big bad Republicans want to do terrible things. Like one of the things they say, Obamacare should apply to the federal bureaucrats yeah, as well right. as the legislators yep. who are currently exempt. Seems yeah. only fair. If you have a federal law, it should apply to everybody. To everybody Including equally. the people who passed the law. Including congressmen and senators. I totally agree. But Obama says, uh, President Obama says that's a nasty thing. They can't be in the law, and the senators, the U.S. Senate, run by the Democrats, mm -hmm. essentially, they took it out and sent it back to the House without that. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, those delays of Obamacare that Obama, <coughs> President Obama, has voluntarily recommended because this was not ready for prime time yet. So, the, the Republicans want some other delays, mainly, I guess, we've delayed it for corporations, but we haven't delayed it for individuals, so they would like to delay it for individuals for one year. Obama says, no, no, let's shut down the government. Mm -hmm. we, if we could have that, see, the Republicans are causing the shutdown, they've passed a bill, right. continuing resolution, but it has the one-year delay, and Obama says, they're causing the shutdown. So tomorrow morning, when all of the major media like ABC, NBC, CBS, MSNBC, CNN, PBS, <coughs> TTW all speak to you as if this was caused by the Republicans, you can ask them and say, not really, because if Obama had reasonably negotiated this, I mean, he, he wants to negotiate with Iran, but he won't negotiate with the Republicans in the State House. Mm -hmm. You mean in little, Congress, U.S. Congress? I mean, Congress, yeah, not yeah, in the U.S. Yeah. Congress. And, but back, and the back US to House state is, politics. <laughs> okay, so back to state politics. Yeah. But you see, there is a relationship, because you were just saying you want the pensions. You're saying you're going to set the example and saying you're declining this. You don't really right. need this, you know, and it should start. And because the form starts there. So I'm saying the analogy is sort of so, like trying to be even-handed on the federal level. So as well. part, of, part of my legislator salary goes into a self-managed plan. I don't get a match from the state. Okay. But this this bill that I propose, you put your money in yourself, and you know it's there. So you're building your own pension plan that right. nobody else could screw with, right. which is one reason why John Tillman, CEO of the Illinois Policy Institute, and the Illinois Policy Institute back your plan because they want something that's not a defined benefit, defined contribution. Individuals must put in a certain percentage. Right. The state must put in a certain percentage and then the individuals manage it, right? Yes, that's right. And Within so bounds, just like 401ks are managed, you can't go and start investing in pork bellies, but you can invest in diversified right. portfolio stocks and bonds. And, and, as a, and the politicians can't, they can't touch it. No, that's they right. They can't get their hands on it. They can't screw it up. That's right. And so let me tell you about some conversations I've had. Because initially when I came out with this, there was a lot of opposition because either people didn't understand what it did or they were only listening to what the the union bosses were telling them in Springfield. 
But as this has dragged on, as this crisis, and it is a crisis, it's a crisis for the taxpayers, it's a crisis for the participants in the pension plan who have no certainty that we're going to be able to resolve this. I mean, th those who are, who are older right now or who are currently retired, they're probably going to be okay. But those who, anyone who's younger uh, or in their middle age uh, years uh, is in deep, deep trouble. Look at the city of Detroit, for example. I mean, there, it's not an apples to apples comparison, but look at Detroit. The polls would say and, these and younger people believe it's more likely they'll see Martians in their backyard tomorrow than they will see a reliable pension plan when it comes time for them to retire. That's correct. And right. so that's why we need to do something bold. Give them the power to manage their own money. Every single paycheck they would get funds put in their self-managed account. So what a teacher, a teacher told me recently, he's been teaching for 27 years. He said, you know, Morrison, I heard about your plan and initially I was against it, but as this has dragged on, all of a sudden I realized my entire retirement nest egg is in Springfield. And I do not trust mm -hmm. the legislators. So I don't prefer, trust you. So your bill, <laughs> your he bill could go back and do it that way, where his money would have been under his control, not under the politicians. Right. He would do it. He could have invested in okay. just an index uh, fund, very, very low fees, because that's one okay. complaint about 401ks. No, but what do we do now? So you're supporting your bill, much as you believe in it, Jeannie Hayes believes in it, right. Over, Jim Oberweiss believes in it, Senator Oberweiss, mm -hmm. John Tillman, Raleigh well, Policy Institute maybe others. And now a smattering of teachers and public smattering. workers. It's, uh, it's not going to get called by Senate President Cullerton. No. It's not going to get called by Speaker Madigan. Those are the two Democrats who rule this General Assembly. If they say we're not going to call it, you don't even get a chance to see what legislators I couldn't get it out of committee. That's, that is true. Committee. Right. So in the meantime, being a pra practical guy, uh -huh. what is it you're supporting for state employee pension reform? Well, there were two major pension uh, proposals in the spring. One was was called the Madigan Bill. That was uh, Senate Bill 1. The other one was the the Cullerton Bill, uh, Senate Bill 2404. The unions had a lot to do with, with the latter bill, 2404. Uh, I did vote for Senate Bill 1, the Madigan Bill, uh, with the caveat that it is a first step. Yeah. Because, and, and Representative Ives and I and uh, Representative McSweeney also spoke on the floor, Representative Kay, all of us wanted to make sure we got into the record that this is a first step. Because it is not a, it it's is not not a solution. solution. No, mm. it just it delays the day of reckoning by two or three okay. years. That's okay. exactly right. Does it cut? What does it do? Can you give us the specifics? As well, the, it's kind of moot. In broad strokes, what does it do to bring about reform? Uh, does it cut benefits? Which one? Senate Bill 1? Yeah, the, Senate, the Madigan Bill. Uh, it would have... Um, um, Increase the retirement age slightly, you know, on a sliding slightly, scale. Okay. Uh, would have increased the employee contributions just ever so slightly. Okay. The the three percent uh, cost of living adjustment would have been more closely tied to the cost, of, the actual cost of living. cost of living, the CPI. So it, it so, changes the, what's now statutory three percent, no matter what, right, to something approximating the actual increase in cost of living. Correct. That's an right. important, that's yeah. a major improvement, right? Right. And I think it's important for your... Also, does it allow compounding or no? Uh, no, that, 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 that's where there would have been one adjustment. Um, there would be, so it would it remove be, compounding? Well, I... It's hard to say. It's, it's hard to say. It's kind of off the okay. table now because okay. this conference committee is trying to negotiate between those well, two Well, before bills. we get to that, we only, we still have about 10 minutes left. So that's the House bill. That's the Madigan bill. And you supported that. Then there was a yeah, Senate. But bill. reluctantly. I was I, I reluctantly supported it. <laughs> because you had to choose between one and Because I don't think it goes far enough. It's you, still you would prefer your proposal, but yeah. that's not gonna get called. Right. And if you're choosing between the Madigan bill and the Cullerton bill, you clearly prefer the Madigan bill, right? Um, if I had to choose yeah, I mean that was the choice we were given. It's like end. libertarians sometimes when you say if you had to choose between a Democrat and Republican what would you choose? And they tell me oh, they would choose suicide. Okay, <laughs> it's somewhat analogous. Well, okay, but you wouldn't choose suicide here. Okay, but the Senate bill does less in terms of adjustments. Does it adjust the cola the way we've talked about? Does it make the cola the cost of living as opposed to three percent? Does it do that? Uh, th that was one Madigan, component. The Cullerton bill, right? We'll I, I don't remember the exact detail. I think it does less. It saves yeah. a lot less. Right. It does less on the retirement age, less on the employee contribution going up. In general, Senator, Senate President Cullerton's view would be less is more, right? Less, less well, reduction, fewer benefits. It means more for the Democratic Party because it alienates 
the public sector unions less, and you get more contributions in. And if you get more contributions in, you get more Democrats keeping their Senate seats, and then John President stays, John Cullerton stays president. So see how that works? Less is more. Less for you, more for John. Yeah, well, right. is that, would, one, you, would you go along with that? Less for the citizens, less for the taxpayers, more for Senate President Cullerton. The, the problem is for and John, if, you, if we got it wrong, come on and defend the show. We haven't seen you in the last four or five years. We know you're busy, but you know. Yeah. I mean, state rep Tom Morrison can come. <laughs> uh, the problem is for the workers themselves, that, that there is no real guarantee for them because we have a constitution that, that guarantees yeah. that pensions cannot be diminished. But remember, all these changes we talked about it were does added, say that. It does they were say added that. legislatively. Yeah. They were added there, legislatively. Are, there, are, there are constitutional lawyers who say it doesn't mean you can't reduce benefits in the future. Going forward, yeah. So your proposal, the Madigan proposal, they say be constitutional. Suddenly, suddenly, I don't know if we have it here. See, this is the U.S. Constitution, but if we have the state ones. Suddenly, John, John Cullerton has become a strict constructionist. Really? Yeah. Strict constructionist. I never knew John because he's quite liberal. Like, have you ever talked to him about abortion? Couldn't find it in here, but he says, yeah, there's a constitutional right for a woman to have an abortion. Strict constructionist. Well, no, not so much on abortion, just on when you want to reduce the benefits to public sector unions, then John's a strict constructionist. Well, here's, here's what I want your viewers to look up. Go to uh, website howmoneywalks.com. Howmoneywalks. Dot com. It, it's a uh, very user friendly. How money walks out of the state? Yeah, it, it's How user jobs walk out of the state. Well, money. It, it uses IRS tax okay. data for the last decade, showing state on a state by state basis and a county by county basis where money is flowing, and it does not bode well for Illinois if we keep down the same path. Okay, but so we, we got on pensions. It's an important issue. We've spent most of the show. We weren't going to do that, but we have. It's an important but issue. But you tie it up. So as of September 30th. The leaders, Cullerton and Madigan, were butting heads. And on this, they couldn't resolve, apparently, or some would say they don't want to. So even though they couldn't resolve it, they couldn't reach agreement, they each essentially appointed with the, right, with the Republican leaders people to the pension committee. There are 10 people appointed. And somehow that committee is supposed to resolve what Cullerton and Madigan can't. Mm -hmm. As of today, do you think they will resolve it? I the think there, there will be a bill, and it, it'll be a weak some weak compromise. Weak, something and something that's between my Madigan. Yeah, so right. it would be less strong, less beneficial to the state than even the Madigan bill. Right, right. and less beneficial to the workers all, long term. And less beneficial to the residents. These younger the teachers, those in their 20s, 30s, early 40s, they're, they're still going to be in trouble. See, you're not sanguine. You're not hopeful. Basically, you're saying this does not solve it. And I guess you as a Republican would say if you want to solve this problem, you would say people are going to have to elect more Republicans to the state well, house and the would, Senate. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Yeah. Because in the state house, it's 71, 47, or 71 the, Democrats, 47. Mm -hmm. That would be the contribution of what's that guy's name who's running for treasurer now in the Republican Party? Uh, Tom Cross. Yeah, he, Tom never came on the show, but Tom was too busy. As the state oh. house leader who wants to now be the treasurer, he was too busy. What was oh. the what was the margin of the Republicans when Tom came in? They were down. Yeah. They didn't have the majority. But were they down 71 to 47? I, I don't know. But you do know. No, I don't know. I was, you, think, I was, you think it was worse than 71 to 47? Oh, no, it wasn't worse. I don't have it so exactly. So Tom, who's been there like a decade, I think, his contribution is to make it worse. Really, that's his contribution. So Let's talk, now yeah. Jim Durkin's there, and we're going to yeah. say, Jim, you're going to be evaluated. But using this really low bar that the Republicans have, can you do any worse? Can you do any worse than Tom Cross has? Because if you don't, you're in. Right? Well, remember that the map making process is. Uh, oh is, is yeah, but, but but you but partly they lost the map because they couldn't elect a Republican governor. And shouldn't right. Tom Cross be partly responsible? Isn't that partly his job as a state house leader to go out and elect a Republican governor? Isn't it? Well, the. the isn't the, it? No, the, the, the responsibility. Who gets the blame? A, Bill Brady, all, all on his yeah. own. Redonio and Cross walk away, and all Republican leaders walk away. And the fact that Bill Brady lost for governor, it's all his fault? That's, no, no, that, but we've got to just shouldn't move. It, shouldn't the stage you appeal? No, you have to hold people accountable. Yeah. 
We're going to continue to speak as the credits roll, but I really have to differ with you, Representative Morrison. Mm -hmm. You have to hold people accountable. You cannot do this la di da stuff about, oh, let's move on, let's all be friends. Yeah, no, we're, no, we're not uh, la di da, not, okay. not in any stretch. But did you, don't you have to hold Cross accountable for his failure? Don't you have to hold him In the governor's race, I, I... Okay, let's go quickly <laughs> to their governor's race. Who are right. supporting there? Uh, I am uh, not going to, uh, probably yeah. not going to endorse anybody. Really? No. So not Bruce Rauner. So everybody's going to be a contender. Not Kirk Dillard, not Bill Brady, not Dan Rutherford. Those are the four candidates yeah. for governor in the Republican they're, Party. They're all going to contend. Uh, each one has uh, assets that are going to help them. And you can't, gonna, see, enough, be a you can't see enough of a difference to say, I'm going to put my, you know, my neck out and support somebody. I'm as a conservative. Don't you think your people look to you for some moral leadership? Some guidance. Well, if on an issue by issue basis, there are certain. I mean, you went like to Hillsdale College, okay? Yeah. Really, uh, yeah. that's a good school. Sure. You learned how to make judgments. Shouldn't people benefit from that? I mean, give us your sure. best shot. You're pro-life, right? Yes. Bruce Rauner, he's pro-choice, right? Yeah. Well, some people say his wife's pro-choice. He's really pro-life. That's what Jack Roser would say. But then Jack couldn't come on the show because he said the people in his office told him he shouldn't do the show. That would be well, moral leadership. Jack, it's so sad that at 90 years old you can't make your own choices. And we say well, that out of respect for you, Jack. Uh -huh. Change your mind. Show some stuff, okay? You know, be the Jack we used to know. Come on, public affairs. Tell us about Bruce Rauner and why you're supporting him. Because you think he's pro-life? Do you think Jack got that right? Is Rauner really pro-life? I wouldn't uh, know. I don't know that we can ascertain that from his statements. So. But Does it matter? He's saying the right thing on pensions. What I about mean, what about Rutherford? Is Rutherford using the state treasurer's office as a bully pulpit? That's what he said four years ago. If he became state treasurer, he'd use it as. A, has he gone out and talked about state employee pension reform? Dan Rutherford. I no, I haven't heard him talking about that. And so he broke that promise. He's not used it as a bully. Mm -hmm. Dan, come on and defend yourself. We're hammering you. We're going to hammer you. Hmm. Hammer. So you got then Dillard and Brady left. Two guys. Okay, they're yeah. both pro-life. They're both strong on employee pension reform. State employee pension reform, they're both good on not raising taxes, would you say? Yeah, oh Brady, yeah, Rutherford? For, for sure. So is it a toss-up between Rutherford and Brady? Uh, um, you know, it's, it's early. I'm, I'm, I'm so you might, you, you, might, you might come out and endorse? I, well, I'm going to disappoint you, Jeff, not, not on this show. Here, hold that ball, okay? <laughs> hold that ball. I mean, it gets firm as you hold it, okay? People look for some, some leadership. Yeah, well, it's, it's you early. You're you know, just going to straddle the fence? I mean, seriously? In a, in a gubernatorial primary? Yeah. yeah. At this point, we're early on. So last we're time early. around, you didn't support anybody in 2010 either? Um, well, I voted for someone. but No, uh, but in the primary, did you support anybody? I, I was running my own race okay. for governor. Yeah. I mean, I mean, in the last time there was a Who you supported for race? president in 2016? Ted Cruz? I like Ted Cruz. I would like you him support him, you think? Well, I mean, it's early. If, we're, if, we're <laughs> if you had to choose now, would you support Ted Cruz? I don't know. Honestly, I don't know enough about him to support him for president. But I, I, for what I've seen so far, I like him. You're watching the Illinois Channel, an independent nonprofit corporation formed to provide gavel to gavel coverage of Illinois state government and other public affairs events taking place across Illinois. 